I see people up against seemingly the most impossible, insurmountable, seemingly insurmountable things overcome, get to the other side of impossible. So I want to just give people hope and, and realize that these are not quick fix issues. Certainly they're not. It's my understanding you're going to talk about gut health and how that might tie into air quality and all the other amazing things that we do as human beings on this planet. So uh, really excited. Thank you so much for being here uh, at the first annual Change the Air Summit. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And uh, as you know, my heart and my passion is to help people that are struggling with different what the world may call mystery illnesses, but to actually make them not like demystify them and actually show the physiological and the mental emotional components to them. So people with different issues like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, autoimmune problems, infl different inflammatory problems. So thanks for the opportunity. Of course. So if you will please share your screen and dive yeah. right in. Perfect. All right here. I'm going to go. Yeah, right There we go. All right, my friends, we're going to learn all about gut feelings and healing the microbiome mind connection from shame, trauma, and other junk foods. So first of all, I think my, Michael did a great intro on me, so I don't even need to go into this, but I love what I do. This is basically all that I do. I live in this room and I consult people 11 hours a day and occasionally they let me out to eat and uh, see my kids and my uh, golden doodles <laughs> and my wife. <laughs> uh, but I write books about this stuff as well. I've written Ketotarian, the Inflammation Spectrum, Intuitive Fasting, and Gut Feelings is the newest book, um, which we're going to get even more granular here. You're going to get different stuff that you're not going to get in the book. Um, and then obviously the book is expounding on a lot of this as well. Well, well. So what the heck is functional medicine? In short, it, it we're interpreting labs using a thinner reference range. We're looking at optimal, not average. Uh, and the lab's reference range is largely based on a statistical bell curve average of people who go to labs. People that go to labs, sadly, are people with health problems. So we're looking at a tighter interval of numbers within that larger reference range to look at the gray areas. And we realize that health and health problems exist on a spectrum. And by the time somebody is diagnosed with a health problem like autoimmune, like an autoimmune condition or chronic fatigue syndrome, for most people, it's about four to 10 years prior to that diagnosis when things are kind of brewing on that, that inflammation spectrum that I talk about with patients. Gosh, that makes so much sense. Exactly. Yeah. So we want to look at optimal on average. We want to realize that we're all different. So the major fa facet of functional medicine is bio-individuality. We're all different. There's a lot of nuance and sort of granular upstream root drivers to things like autoimmune issues and CFS and other inflammatory problems, things like anxiety, depression, brain fog as well. So in today's little combo with you, I'm going to talk about the bi-directional relationship between our thoughts and emotions and physical health, both gut and feelings, if you will, the physiological gut and the mental, emotional, spiritual feelings. And the fact in the West, we like to separate mental health from physical health, but reality, the reality is mental health is physical health. And we're going to see the emotional and the physical side to these issues. I mean, you hear this phrase, right? Gut feelings, trust your gut, gut instinct. They all have uh, ancient origins. And somehow our ancestors knew that the gut was the seat of the soul. And you could take it on a spiritual level, and even a mental, emotional, sort of uh, philosophical level, if you will. But actually, it's quite physiological as well. There's a lot of clinical data to show that the connection between the gut and the brain and how it's mediated by the gut microbiome, the vagus nerve, the parasympathetic nervous system, the enteric nervous system. So we're really going to talk about that, that physiological and the mental, emotional, spiritual stuff today. So our gut is formed from the same fetal tissue. So when babies are growing in their mother's womb, that gut and brain are formed from that same fetal tissue, and it's inextricably linked for the rest of our life through what's known as the gut-brain axis. 95% of serotonin, 50% of dopamine is made in the gut, stored in the gut. We know that different imbalances in the gut microbiome can play a major role in our way our mood is. So it can impact in things like anxiety and depression. It's actually linked as a causal driver for some people, meaning it's actually is the underlying cause of it is imbalances in the gut. And um, 
And the air we breathe plays a major role in our larger microbiome as well. So the foods we're eating or the foods we're not eating, the air we're breathing or the, air, the healthy air that we're not breathing can all influence our larger microbiome, our skin microbiome, our sinus microbiome, our lungs, and our gut microbiome. Yeah, it makes so, a lot of sense. Yeah. So first of all, let's talk about how the physical impacts the emotional. We're going to look at underlying gut problems, environmental toxins like glyphosate and other air pollutants and, and water pollutants in our water as well, inflammatory foods, biotoxins like mold toxins, chronic Lyme disease, and different viral infections, and hormonal imbalances. So first, there's a report out of Scientific American showing that specific bacterial imbalances in the gut can actually impact our cravings. So people think, oh, I've just have low willpower, there's something wrong with me, I'm weak. But actually, your gut microbiome can be influencing the foods you're craving. So if, if anybody's tried to cut out sugar, and it can be difficult for some people, some people it's harder than others, well, it could be actually what's going on in your gut. And if you're looking at the gut microbiome, which is all the trillions of bacteria, depending on the study that you look at, we can be upwards of 100 trillion bacteria. And to put that into perspective, we have about 10 trillion human cells. So we're all about 10 times more bacteria than human. And it's wow. sort of this sophisticated host for the microbiome, which we've evolved with, and there's sort of this symbiotic relationship with. Um, but in many ways, we are at the whim of our microbiome, and um, it, and it impacts our mood. That's our incredible. Cravings. It is. It's, it's what it sounds science fiction. I what I think of this, this is a horrible a tangent. But if you remember in the 90s, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and you think of what was his name, Crag or Krang, the brain inside of that robot thing, in mm. like the seed of it, I think of that villain on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where the microbiome is his brain, and we're like this robot. It's kind <laughs> of like the microbiome. Um, so the uh, things that we see on labs for patients, things like bacterial overgrowth, things like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, yeast and fungal overgrowth, leaky gut syndrome. These are all quantifiable on labs that we run for people around the world um, as associated with things like anxiety, depression, OCD, autoimmunity, brain fog, fatigue, insomnia, ADHD, and those physiological components too these mental health issues, brain health issues. So this is um, different bacterial pathogens that we can quantify on labs, different bacterial overgrowth. This is uh, C. difficile, other opportunistic bacteria, pathogenic bacteria, different potential autoimmune triggers of these bacteria that are higher in what are called these lipopolysaccharides, which are these bacterial endotoxins. We can, as somebody can have leaky gut syndrome, things passing through the gut that should not be able to pass through the gut. They also can have what the researchers refer to as leaky brain syndrome, which is increased blood brain barrier permeability. And there's a whole field of research in the scientific journals referred to as the cytokine model of cognitive function. Cytokines are pro-inflammatory cells. So there's research looking at how inflammation impacts how our brain works. This part right here on the slide shows an increase of the blood brain barrier meaning that the things are passing through the blood-brain barrier, creating neuroinflammation or brain or nervous system inflammation levels. So this is a blood test that we run for um, patients. You know, what's really interesting about the previous slide was that um, we're seeing an increase in water damage homes of the presence of like strep or staph, you know, uh, gram-positive bacteria, which we probably know just due to strep and staph uh, infections. Fascinating. Yeah. And that, that's the thing too. People think, where does this come from? I get that question a lot. So what, where did this come from? Well, we need to take into consideration all the possibilities. It could be the air we're breathing, it could be the home or workplace or car that you are driving around. We've seen just about everything with variable wise and obviously foods we're eating, things we're exposed to. And it's environmental exposure. So we have to look at all of the variables. Um, and then for some people, not everybody, you can quantify the sort of neurological autoimmune is, uh, issues, things like myelin sheath, which will, the end stage of that will become MS or can become MS and other neuro uh, autoimmune markers. So uh, definitely when it's clinically appropriate based on health history, these are labs that we run for, for people. Um, this is a lab that's very conventional. It's a home, it's homocysteine. It's an inflammatory marker studies that found just slightly elevated, marginally elevated homocysteine can act as a neurotoxin, a, a brain toxin, nervous system toxin. 
and increases blood brain barrier permeability or that leaky brain syndrome that I mentioned um, previously. And it can, it's associated with mild cognitive impairment, which mainly people would describe as brain fog, word recall, name recall issues, fatigue, fuzziness on the brain. They feel hungover, but they're not hungover. So these are classic neuroinflammatory symptoms that people should not settle for. Many people think, ah, it's just my everyday. And just because something's common doesn't necessarily mean it's normal. Just because something's your everyday doesn't mean you should settle for it. And we can see here, there are multiple variables to consider of things that are can be contributing factors or underlying causes of things like fatigue and brain fog and anxiety and depression mm -hmm. as well. A glyphosate, which is used is as a herbicide, insecticide in the modern farming, it is um, can definitely uh, decimate the human microbiome, just like it can be decimating to the soil microbiome as far as the, our, the soil of the earth. And our gut microbiome and skin microbiome and the sinus microbiome is intimately connected to the soil, larger earth planetary microbiome. So insult to one will insult the other. And this is a urine test that we measure for patients. Uh, and it, without a doubt, as an herbicide, uh, can really decimate our microbiome. And I'll show on the next slide how it's also associated, associated with neuroinflammation. So things like anxiety and depression and brain fog and fatigue and ADHD and other things that are have inflammatory components, we need to look at this. So this is glyphosate coming out in the urine in high levels. This yeah. is not normal. Um, and here, there's a study just in 2022 showing that glyphosate can infiltrate the brain and increases pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, being implicated in different neurodegenerative disorders. Wow. And this was out of the Journal of Neuroinflammation. Now, let's look at how the emotional impacts the physical. So things like trauma and stress, chronic stress and, and shame and even intergenerational trauma. Uh, are associated in the research to things like chronic fatigue syndrome, hormone imbalances, autoimmune inflammation disorders, a hypervigilant nervous system, thyroid issues, digestive issues. And I've seen, these are just some examples of how I've seen people do everything they're supposed to do on a physical side, but that they're dealing with these unresolved past traumas or current stressful, mental, emotionally stressful situations. I know that they can't, can't fully heal until they deal with these underlying issues like chronic stress and shame and trauma. And this is where mental health crosses over into physical health. Exactly. And we cannot, like, it has to be a both and not an either or approach to really reclaim somebody's health. So something that we call in the clinic is shame inflammation, like how the mental, emotional, spiritual stuff impacts the physiological. So using shame as sort of a symbol of that and how it impacts things like inflammation, how it creates a hypervigilant immune system, i.e. chronic inflammation and a hypervigilant nervous system in the form of somebody being stuck in that sympathetic fight or flight stressed state, which impacts how they feel on that level too. Stress in many ways is the ultimate junk food, right? You could eat the best superfoods, the most nutrient dense, clean diet. But if you're serving your body a big slice of stress every day, you could be sabotaging your body just as much as that, that quote unquote junk food. But this is sort of the ripple effect that stress raises catecholamines and impacts the immune system in a negative way. It releases histamines, it alters signaling and blood sugar balance in the body. It impacts the HCL production of the gut, increasing something called hypochlorhydria, decreased hydrochloric acid in the gut. Obviously, all of this raises inflammation. 75% of Inf of the immune system is in the gut. Inflammation is a product of the immune system. So it's this gut brain axis. Um, and it causes a ripple effect in the body. These are some studies looking at how trauma and people with PTSD, um, how that impacts our health. We've known for decades that adverse childhood experiences or something called ACE an ACE score. And for every telehealth patient we have, we have them fill out an ACE score because of how important it is. And how we know from studies that kids that people that go through traumatic incidences in the early years are at increased risk of other of different chronic health problems and how trauma can influence the microglia which is the brain's immune system the old thought of the brain was that the brain was immune privileged is how it was referred to as that the brain was it did not have its own immune system and the inflammation did not impact the 
the brain because of the blood brain barrier. But now we know because of increased blood brain barrier permeability and the brain having its own immune system in the form of microglia, that trauma, just like toxins, just like mold toxins and environmental toxins like glyphosate that we talked about can breach that blood brain barrier and contribute to neuroinflammation wow. in the body. Other study in 2009 looked at it as well, like cumulative childhood stress, and it's shown increased risk of auto triggering autoimmune conditions. And then as if that wasn't heavy enough, there's something called intergenerational transgenerational trauma in that we as humans aren't just the way that we are because of who we are, but because of the, actually the life and experiences of our grandparents, grandparents, and even great grandparents and beyond. And this is research looking at how, for example, a Ukrainian famine in the 1930s resulted in the death of millions of people, but their, their ancestors, their descendants uh, had increased risk of different inflammatory problems. Same with the Holocaust. But I know I have no doubt that obviously trauma exists on a spectrum. These are extreme examples in the medical journals, but the reality is we have to think that we are the product of a lot of things. And just like families can, you know, donate, you know, they they pass things on. To, 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 you get heirlooms, right? Not donate. You you inherit the heirlooms. On an epigenetic level, from a methylation standpoint, how your body is detoxing and how inflammation is governed and how the body detoxes things, you, from an epigenetic side of things, we we actually inherit things from our ancestors. So we have to realize that this is, if anything, I think it, it should give some people grace that, you know, this isn't just me. I, I, uh, I really am a product of a lot of stuff, but as trauma can be inherited, so can healing. And I see people break the chains of, trauma and shame and health problems all the time and not only heal themselves they heal their families and their children's children and generations they'll never get to see and they'll really have a legacy of healing so this is i want people to be empowered and excited about we have to know what we're dealing with to do something about it so yes these are heavy things but when you, we can do something about it when we know when we know what we're up against well it's really interesting Autom because you have like these genetic cells right and cells have memory right and we I don't think we know, uh, uh, you know, in our current uh, standards of technology, if that memory gets passed down from person to person, I mean, what you're suggesting would, would almost assume yes. And, uh, yeah. that would, that would make it make a lot of sense. I think in that, you know, intergenerational, uh, trauma that we experience. Yeah, absolutely. And these are, that's it. These are the confluence of factors that we take into consideration in functional medicine. It's not just one thing. It's a, it's a perfect storm of variables. And the researchers refer to it as autoimmunity as the immune system losing recognition of self, in quotations. If you think about what's hap that's happening on a physiological level in the form of molecular mimicry when the immune system starts attacking certain parts of the body, there's over 100 different autoimmune conditions. There's an additional 50 that have an autoimmune component that, that mainstream medicine uh, recognizes today. The reality is there with time, there'll be millions of more different issues that are being discovered as having autoimmune components. But think about what's happening on a physiological level, the immune system losing recognition of self. And then on a mental, emotional, spiritual level, I think of all the patients over the years that in many ways on that level have lost recognition of self. Isn't that sort of on a philosophical level, how things go happening on a mental, emotional, spiritual level, how is that impacting their physical body? How are these things stored in the cells and impacting the way they're immune system and nervous system ex are expressing themselves. So there's a, a theory called the polyvagal theory that really describes what I'm talking about here, how things like stress and shame and trauma can be stored in the body and we how we have to be supporting this person to getting out of this dorsal vagal phase of like, I can't cope, I'm collapsed, I'm shut down, I'm hypervigilant, maybe in that sympathetic zone and into that ventral vagal, which is I feel connected to the greater world, that parasympathetic resting digesting state so that's just sort of the combination of things that we consider and everybody's pieces to their pulse is going to be different it's not the same for everybody there's a lot of bio individuality when it comes to this but this, these are some of the common things that we take into consideration with our telehealth patients is the physical stressors and the psychological stressors that we talked about here
So most of our patients, as I mentioned, their parasympathetic resting digesting state is inhibited and their parasympathetic, sorry, yeah, the parasympathetic is inhibited and their sympathetic fight or flight stressed inflamed state is overactive. And we need to sort of recalibrate that through functional medicine. So this is a little case study, this shame inflammation storm cycle that we see so often, sadly, this patient specifically is 39 years old. She's actually still in care now in maintenance. She uh, has brain fog, fatigue, anxiety and depression, bloating, constipation, like IBS issues, uh, history of autoimmune markers, like ANA has been positive in the past. This is a urine mycotoxin test. What did we find? She's like so many of our patients say, yeah, I don't have any mold. It's not an issue for me. Like mm -hmm. I, my house is brand new. I mean, how many times do we hear that, right? Yeah. Like it's so common, sadly. But when we look, we can see, oh, well, just because the house is new doesn't mean there's no mold in there. Or it may not be your home. It may be maybe somewhere else. Right. Um, but we see high levels of ochratoxin, which is the mold toxin released by aspergillus, stachybotrys. Um, black mold released high levels of, of high levels of the mycotoxins are clearing out in her urine as well. Not normal. And genetically, she had different HLA gene variants and different methylation gene variants that make her more biotoxin sensitive back to bio individuality and epigenetics and genetics. Not everybody is going to have the same reaction as, as you, because we're all different. We all have a different threshold from a genetic and an epigenetic standpoint. And as you can see, these confluence of factors kind of hit that tipping point for her. Over time, mold toxins and other environmental toxins like bacteria will decrease the migrating motor complex or the MMC, which is the gut brain axis, the vagus nerve kind of communication. And that allows different bacterial overgrowth to overgrow. So this is a SIBO breath test, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth breath test. And she had bloating, the constipation was really driven by SIBO, but the SIBO didn't happen in a vacuum upstream to that. Mycotoxins are at least implicated to some degree, if not really significantly, in my opinion, of how the cascade or ripple effect, because the body's interconnected, one issue will create an issue downstream. This is, was her ACE score, her adverse childhood experience score. So we talk about things like psychological abuse growing up or sexual abuse growing up, physical abuse growing up, substance abuse in the home, neglect in the home, mental health in the household. Well, how are your parents' relationships? This is heavy stuff, especially when you're first meeting somebody on a, in a webcam call. But the reality is this is important. This is, this is setting the ground for somebody being more prone to being sensitive because your nervous system's already in a hypervigilant state. Yeah. This is a histamine test to measure histamine intolerance. We know people that have mold toxins and SIBO and other biotoxins are more prone to having mast cell activation syndrome, or MCAS and histamine intolerance. So we realized that again, yes, histamine intolerance is causing some of her symptoms like migraines and anxiety, but ultimately what's causing the histamine intolerance in the first place. So it, kind of an obvious state here, but when the body's stuck in that sympathetic stress state, hormones are going to take a hit because the parasympathetic is kind of on a back burner and uh, estrogen was low, progesterone is low, testosterone was lower and cortisol you're going to see typically low when it should be high or high when it should be low. A more progressed chronic fatigue syndrome is associated typically in the research with lower cortisol because cortisol is not inherently bad. It's an endogenous immunosuppressant. So that basically it's a natural anti-inflammatory. She was not so progressed as some of our patients, but it's still dysregulation of the endocrine system for sure. Right. The dysautonomia is sort of the end stage of it, but it's a dysregulated nervous system. Um, but really dysautonomia is really part of a larger dysregulated nervous system spectrum. It's not just the diagnosable dysautonomia. Um, as you can see here, it's sort of the, the cascade of things, this of this shame inflammation storm cycle, physiological and psychological stressors from her past and currently, how that impacts inflammation, impacting hormones, impacting things like histamines. The brain is rich with these H3 receptors, these histamine receptors impacting neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. Coincidentally enough, 95% of serotonin and 50% of dopamine, if you remember, it's made in the gut and stored in the gut. So the gut's being impacted as far as production, but then the brain's being impacted as far as the signaling of these neurotransmitters. Um, so really it's a combination of different factors. So in functional medicine, we have to 
do things that support the parasympathetic nervous system. So that involves feeding your gut and brain and feeding your head and your heart, the gut and the feeling side of it. The gut side of it, we want to work on things that are calming to the gut, nourishing the gut, really work on healing the gut over time and supporting gut health and microbiome health. And really realizing like there's, there's this like sort of supercharged conversation around food, around diet culture and anti-diet culture. We really teach our patients what we call food peace. It's really finding out what your body loves and what your body hates. And it's not about diets or not diets. It's just what's be my own end of one experiment and find the foods that love me back. And eating foods that love you back is not restrictive. It's self-respect and avoiding things that don't love you back is restrict is is loving your body enough to nourish it with good things and continuing to eat foods that don't love you back is like staying in this sort of toxic relationship and wondering why you're still miserable so it's really <laughs> freeing yourself from this sort of confusion online with dr google and all the conversations on social media just saying like what does my body love what loves me back let's focus on that so this is what we call our food peace flag of flexibility lightness, awareness, grace, and really just using meals as a medicine meals and, and meals as a meditation, eating more mindfully. These are some really granular protocol things that we do for patients supporting core nutrient deficiency deficiencies like magnesium, vitamin D, um, and, um, T3 and K2, biotoxin protocol to deal with the mycotoxins and SIBO, methylation support to stabilize that and bring home to stabilize, stabilize the histamine and uh, bring down homocysteine levels, mast cell stabilizers like quercetin and vitamin C, adaptogens and medicinal mushrooms to support the brain adrenal, the brain thyroid uh, uh, axis, and exogenous ketones can be a great brain source for a time. So, and then feeding your head and your heart, we deal with things like self-compassion practices, somatic experiences, breath work, emotional release, forest bathing, the science around that's really fascinating. But you can see in the science, really exploring self-compassion and how people that have higher self-compassion scores have lower inflammation levels. And this is something that we practice over time, you know, perfect. Uh, and over time, you can really cult cultivate stronger self-compassion to help nervous, nourish your nervous system and you lower your inflammation levels. Here's a, a simple self-compassion practice is just talk to yourself the way that you would, if you're going through a stressful life event, talk to yourself like you would uh, talk to a good friend and not blaming or criticizing yourself, but just comforting yourself and letting yourself know, letting yourself know that you're safe and protected and grounded different somatic experiences that we integrate in patients protocols like meditation, breath work, yoga, tai chi, qigong, dancing, drumming even can be a great way to regulate the hypervigilant nervous system. This is a simple one. People can screenshot this or pick up your iPhone right now, take a picture of this. <laughs> it's a great way uh, to a simple somatic practice you can do at home as well. And the, the Japanese actually have something called Rui Katsu, which is literally translates as translates as tear seeking. It's the practice of coming together as a community and crying and how it really releases healthy endogenous opioids and helps basically bring down inflammation levels in the body and regulates the nervous system. And then forest bathing, which is a strange term when it's translated in English. I don't think it's strange. Some people do. But it's Japanese. it comes from the Japanese Jinrin Yoku, which translates as forest bathing in, in English. But it's using nature as a medicine and a meditation, taking in nature with all of your senses to help regulate the nervous system and calm inflammation levels. Just 20 to 30 minutes a day in nature, sitting, walking, using it as a meditation. And it has nervous system benefits. It also has been shown to increase serotonin levels, um, again, 95% of that's made in the gut. So it has sort of a microbiome effect by the positive increase of serotonin or happy neurotransmitter. So that's my talk, my friend. Gut it's feelings. amazing. Yeah, it's out now. But by the time people see this, I'm sure it'll be out. And we talk about this top these topics on the art of being well, and we have new telehealth clinic options for people that are interested in that. Oh, thank you very can, much. This was... I can stop sharing my screen now.
Yes. No, thank you very much. This was uh, fantastic. And, you know, there was a couple of thoughts that came to mind that I wanted to ask some questions about that I thought people might be interested in. One of the things that we hear a lot about with mycotoxin testing specifically is there's this belief that it mostly comes from food. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's probably truth that there are some mycotoxin exposures that people get from food, no doubt, uh, especially if they're eating a lot of grains, peanuts, things of that nature. But what's interesting from my side of things, because I see a lot of data of people's homes, you know, I almost always see that someone has a specific mycotoxin, let, let's, let's say ochratoxin A, for example, and then you see off the charts levels of aspergillus inside their home that's completely abnormal. Um, you know, and, and obviously you do it from the medical side and I don't know if you always get to see data from people's homes to connect dots, but, uh, I would love to, your perspective on that. I mean, do you think we're getting more mycotoxin exposure from air quality or from food? Air quality. Most of the time. I mean, there's exceptions to that rule, certainly, but I would say most of the time it is we, what we find in the body clearing out in their urine or in the blood test, which I didn't show that. Uh, screenshot, but they're blood tests that we can measure antibody production to things like aspergillus and stachybotrys and penicillium. Most of the time we find it in the home or again, it could be workplace and other places too. But yeah, it's air quality, I would say trumps food. Now food can be an exacerbator of symptoms, certainly for many reasons, not just mold toxins. But um, if it's anything that can contribute to inflammation levels, which some levels of mold toxins in food could definitely be a contributing factor on top of other variables to consider with food, can definitely be a piece of the puzzle. But I don't, you'd have to be, in my opinion, most people, you'd have to really be eating a lot of moldy foods to see excess high levels on a mycotoxin test. Um, not that there aren't examples of that, but I would say the vast majority of people should look at the areas that are most likely to have mold. And it's not going to be excess amounts aren't necessarily going to come from food. Well, you obviously have the you know ability to have larger colonies inside your home than you would on, let's say, a strawberry or a piece of toast. Mm -hmm. um, so you're you're much more likely to get a lot more mold through air transmission than, than through food. I mean, I think we learned through COVID that air transmission was one of the ways that uh, COVID really made an impact. Um, and I think, you know, we're starting to turn the corner on air quality and being more mindful of our air quality. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's still a very young and new idea for many people. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about patients that you see on, you know, that you do know had a mold and, you know, fixed their home and, and made it healthy. Uh, I know we've, uh, in our day jobs, we've done a lot of that together. Um, are you mm -hmm. seeing a massive difference in, you know, their symptoms or their labs or any, anything when they do create healthy environments as that intention? Oh yeah. I mean, hundred percent. I mean, that's a massive, and that's why we say for patients, it's like, look, we're going to help you from a physiological side and a mental, emotional side. We're going to deal with all of that stuff. If, if mold toxins or other biotoxins like bacteria are part of your health puzzle, but we're going to clear this stuff out. But if you're not removing the source, you're going to get, you're going to hit a wall to a certain point. You're going to get stuck at a plateau. You're going to be slower in recovery or not for everybody, you're not going to recover really that much at all. You're going to be scratching the surface, maybe decrease severity a little bit because we're increasing methylation, increasing detox pathways. We are supporting their health, but they're kind of not getting to where they need to be. They're spinning their wheels in many ways. So removing the source for those that have to remove the source is paramount to healing, especially for somebody that's biotoxin sensitive. You know, some people can let you know this, but some people that aren't dealing with these other health issues may be less hypervigilant, may be less reactive. But in many ways, it's, these mold toxins from toxic mold, it's not healthy for any human. So whether you're biotoxin sensitive from a genetic like HLA, methylation gene variants or not, I consider our patients in many ways uh, canary in the canary in the coal mine for their family. It's like maybe they're the ones having the fatigue and the flare-ups and the autoimmune problems and the brain fog the neuro symptoms, maybe they are, and maybe their, their spouse or their kids aren't, but it's not healthy for their spouse and their kids. So by healing themselves, 
they're really going to save a lot of health problems potentially down the line down in years later for their for their kids and their partner. Yeah, I think when it comes to creating a healthy home, you know, mold and bacteria are well, they're not as easy unfortunately just from industrial problems, but once you find where the water's coming in, you're pretty it's pretty easy to rectify both of those things at the same time cuz bacteria prominence is typically also tied to the same water damage areas. But glyphosate is a, is a bit of a different thing, right? Do you see people getting that more through exposure from being outdoors, maybe if they're working on a farm, et cetera, or do you see, you know, people getting that from food? It can be from a few places. So it definitely could be yards, depending on what your yard is treated or what your neighbor's yard is treated with as far as like runoff and things being spread via the air as well. Um, so drainage and airflow can definitely impact your yard as well, but certainly look at the products that you are using on your yard, or if you have, you know, lawn care people looking at the products that they're using. And, uh, if you live near farms, certainly, and golf courses, one of the questions we ask is if you live near a golf course, um, because of the products that they're using, and this is not just glyphosate, but this, these are other, uh, products sure. that could be chemicals that can be used. And um, also the uh, foods that we're eating. You know, if your people are eating non-organic, if they're eating, like you said, like a lot of plant-based people, I see high glyphosate, right? Because they're eating so much plant foods mm. that have a lot of benefits. But if they're not mindful of the sourcing of these things, though the highest glyphosate, the foods with glyphosate on them are all plant-based. So um we want to be mindful of that as well as I think the environmental working groups are a great resource to look at what they call the clean 15, the dirty dozen and look at other herbicides like glyphosate and insecticides that are used on, um, on our produce. Then it's probably, you know, if we need to eat non-organic, maybe to, to financial reasons, it's probably really important that we wash our fruits and vegetables thoroughly before we yeah. start to put those into our body. And, and go when you can go and eat more of the conventional things off of the clean 15 list, which is the 15 fruits and vegetables that are the lowest likely, less likely to have higher pesticides and herbicides. That's fantastic advice. Um, anything else that you think people should know about with respects to how air quality, you know, in our homes and workplaces can really impact our health? Well, I mean, I think that I, I, here's another piece of advice is that all of this stuff can be overwhelming to people. And I would say this, I covered a lot of stuff. You're learning a lot during this event. I lean into this information and take notes, lean into it, but give yourself grace, give this process grace and a lightness because stressing and obsessing and having fear and anxiety around these things isn't good for your health either. And that's a lot harder to unpack and give to somebody that knowledge of, of how to lean into this. But, you know, that's why people, experts like yourself and myself are here to really prioritize things. Like let's break it down. We'll take the guesswork out of it as much as we can from a home side and a health, a home health side and a body health side. And Ultimately, too, I see people up against seemingly the most impossible, insurmountable, seemingly insurmountable things overcome, get to the other side of impossible. So I want to just give people hope and and realize that these are not quick fix issues. Certainly they're not. And I take that very seriously that this is going to be a journey, but it's one that's that's achievable and you're not alone. So I, I think that just for people to realize they don't have to have it all figured out to start moving in the right direction. You don't have to be perfect to start moving in the right direction. So just realize that even if you take, where am I at? Like from a bandwidth standpoint, because when someone's going through fatigue or an autoimmune issue, they don't, their bandwidth is oftentimes restricted because they just don't feel well. They don't have the energy to do things they want to do or physically they just can't do it. So give yourself grace with the bandwidth where you're at lean into it, figure out, prioritize like, what are going to be the biggest needle movers for me. And then over time, as you gain resilience and your bandwidth improves, you have a lot more resilience and you can handle more stuff. And you can maybe lean into the things that you really couldn't, 
like you could not address it now. Like it, it's like just too much. But when you start feeling better and get your head above that proverbial water, you can start handling more stuff. And and, and that's what I, I want people to realize is they don't have to do all the things to start feeling better and reclaiming their health. And I think one of the you know most powerful things that I see in, in my day job here is the fact that, you know, the, the most important pillar is getting the data, right? Because if you're going to take a step, it's important you take the right step. And if you assume things and don't base your decisions based on data, then that's where I see people really get overwhelmed. They start taking steps into different directions. It's the wrong direction. And they backtrack and go another direction. A lot of time and money can be wasted on that. And I'm sure you would agree too that data kind of drives the decision-making factors of your recommendations and my recommendations. Yeah. And so it's, you know, you want to take the first step, get the data. And then yes, it'll be overwhelming. Yeah. You might find some issues that are, you know, uh, unsuspected, but you just kind of work at it one step at a time from there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's all, figure outable. We just have to figure out what, what are the most relevant tools for you? Like you said, and, da and data can, labs can give us a baseline and we can see that, that those numbers improve if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Dr. Will Cole, everybody. Dr. Will Cole, thank you so much for being here Thanks, today man. and sharing your infinite wisdom uh, with everybody and uh, can't wait to do something again with you soon. Yes. Nice to see you.